Art of Molecule Podcast Engineering Life and Us Nick Lane is Professor of Evolutionary Biochemistry in the Department of Genetics, Evolution and Environment at the University College London. He has authored five highly regarded books on evolutionary biochemistry, which have sold more than 150,000 copies worldwide and been translated into 25 languages. In this podcast, Lane presents a talk titled The Electrical Origins of Life, which he delivered on November 27, 2023, at the Seminbar event organized by the NCCR Molecular Systems Engineering in Basel. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind welcome. And it, this is what a wonderful place to give a talk. And I've never given a talk uh, following music like that before. This is a completely new experience for me. That was really a wonderful performance. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the Dan Brown of evolutionary biochemistry. Notice the word biochemistry. He didn't say biology. Um, and and um, so I, I kind of feel the need to apologize a little bit because biochemistry is frankly not very easy to um, bring to life for people who aren't already enthusiastic about it. I'm going to have a go, um, and I'm, I'm going to try and tell you, I suppose they're some of my own ideas, not only my ideas, but my way of seeing the question on the origin of life, and it leads into consciousness as well, in, in things like bacteria, so um, I, I know that this... Um, this organization has, uh, has an interest in, in, in the ethics of, um, of molecular biosciences and so on. So um, I don't know if this is going to challenge the ethics, but I hope that it might lead to something of a debate towards the, the end. Okay, first thing to say is we will never know how life started on Earth. Um, even if we invented a time machine and we were able to go back four billion years to the origin of life, we could not agree among ourselves, as scientists in, in this field, where should we go? Should we go into the atmosphere? Should we find a, 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 a beach? These are stromatolites that you can see. There's actually living, living rocks, you may say. Should we go down into the depths of the ocean? Scientists who work in the field cannot agree with each other about things as simple, you may say, as that. And if we actually did succeed in you know, agreeing on where to go, and we, we, we go there and we find some green slime on a rock, um, do we know if this is a, a, a step en route to the origin of life, or was this some side alley going nowhere in particular? Again, we have no way of knowing. So even if we had a time machine, we still wouldn't be able to answer the question. So you may think it's completely hopeless. Why am I even standing here? Um, well, we can. We can hope to understand it. That's really what we're trying to do. Uh, I don't think there's any likelihood that over the next, say, five to ten years, as some people claim, that we will succeed in producing life in the lab and we'll have cells growing out of some test tube or something. I think we are miles and miles away from doing that. But we can try to understand the kinds of environments, the kind of chemistry going on, and all the steps. We can work out an intellectual framework that will explain how a wet, rocky planet with no life on it whatsoever can give rise to the kind of glorious planet that we live on. How, is it, how can we even think about that transition? I think we can. Uh, what I'd like to try and get across to you this evening is that um, we're beginning to have some ideas, at least some people agree with them, some people don't, but I want to try and persuade you that it's not just hand-waving. So, how do we begin to think about it? I would say for the last 50, 60 years or so, the guide to the origin of life has really been chemistry, what chemistry actually works and which chemistry doesn't work so well. Um, and, and over the last perhaps 15, 20 years, biology has become involved for the first time. 
Um, and, and until then, surprisingly, biologists had almost nothing to say on the origin of life. It was dismissed as armchair speculation of the worst kind, not science at all. Whereas the chemists were thinking, okay, here's an interesting challenge in synthetic chemistry. Can we make the nucleotides that make up DNA or RNA? Can we make the sugars? Can we make the, the lipids to make membranes and so on? It was, a, it was a valid question in synthetic chemistry and they've made all of these things. Uh, and then you have a little problem about, okay, you put them all together in a pot and, and then what happens? Uh, it doesn't just kind of congeal into cells and start crawling out. So, you know, there's something missing still. Biology, life itself, is an interesting guide. And what I'm going to try and suggest to you is that it's, in fact, an excellent guide in three different areas. Energy, um, metabolism, which is one of those words that tends to put a lot of people off, uh, but I'll, I'll try and explain it as likely as I can. And then genetic information, genes, where does information in biology come from? Uh, which I, I think a, a lot of people find more interesting uh, than metabolism. On the other hand, it can become quite obscure quite quickly. When you see the two together, it makes much more sense. So before I get going, I'm going to orientate you to those three themes. This is, um, you could think of this as a bacterial cell, you could think of this as the mitochondria inside your own cells, the mitochondria are the power packs inside your cells, and this is what's happening inside you right now. We're, 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 I'll keep this as simple as I can, we're burning glucose, we're breaking it down to an intermediate, don't, even, don't need to know the name of it, it's acetyl-CoA, and we go through this thing called the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle is, is basically pulling out CO2 and hydrogen. That's all I really want you to get from this. CO2 is a, it, you know, we're breathing it out into the atmosphere, contributing our own little bit to global warming. Uh, and the hydrogen, well, we're splitting the hydrogen, the hydrogen atoms, two hydrogen atoms, we're splitting them into their fundamental parts, the electrons and the protons. And, and the proton, well, we have a current of electrons going to oxygen. That current of electrons literally pretty much an electric wire inside this membrane, inside this insulated membrane, is powering the extrusion of protons across the membrane. So now we have a lot of protons on this side of the membrane, very few protons on the inside, about three orders of magnitude difference, three pH units difference. Um, now that may not seem like very much. It's about a char an electrical charge of about 150 to 200 millivolts. But if you were to shrink yourself down to the size of a molecule and stand right next to this membrane there, you would experience an electrical field strength of a, about 30 million volts per meter. That's equivalent to a bolt of lightning. So this entire surface area of membrane has got an electrical charge equivalent to a bolt of lightning going across it. It's just such a small distance, five nanometers, that the, the, the actual charge is, is quite small, but it's, it's, it's quite a field strength. That is powering everything. I'm showing here a protein called the ATP synthase. I'll come back to that later on. ATP is often called the universal energy currency. In other words, it's powering work. But that work doesn't have to be making this ATP, this en energy currency, any kind of work uh, it can power the bacterial flagellum, which will kind of row a bacterium around the place. It can power CO2 fixation, which is what I'll say more about. Okay, so that's how energy works in biology. That's basically it for all cells. It's kind of, there are variation, plenty of variations on that thing, but this is fundamental. All life works that way. It's amazing. Your own cells work that way, bacteria work that way, stuff that you find high up in the atmosphere, on the outside of the space station, or deep down in the bowels of the Earth, in the deep, hot biosphere, it's all working that way. It's amazing. It's as universally conserved as the genetic code itself. Okay, this looks exactly the same. It's not. It's the opposite. Um, what I'm showing here is this Krebs cycle going in the opposite direction. I've still got hydrogen and CO2. Think what happens, though. Normally, when the Krebs cycle is spinning, it's pulling out hydrogen and CO2 and it's burning the hydrogen in oxygen. The reverse Krebs cycle, and quite a lot of bacteria work this way, is sucking in hydrogen and CO2 and using the energy of this charged membrane to make them react together to form organic molecules, the Krebs cycle intermediates, they're carboxylic acids. And from them, we make amino acids and sugars and nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA and RNA and lipids for the membranes themselves and so on. So, it's not about energy only, it's also about biosynthesis, it's about making the building blocks of life. 
And this is, again, really deeply conserved in biology. Some of the molecules in that Krebs cycle, not necessarily always as a complete cycle, sometimes more as a linear pathway, but there are five molecules in there which are universally conserved across all of life. They are the universal precursors for all of metabolism. This is the starting point for making everything that cells do. And it's all coming from here, and it's powered by this same system, it's just operating in reverse. So it's kind of strange that both metabolism and energy are powered by the same system. There's a tension between which, which way is it going to go? And in our own bodies, it, sometimes it's going both ways. And cancer, very often, is working with the Krebs cycle going in the opposite direction, in this reverse direction, making the building blocks to make new cells to power the growth of cancer cells. So that's, in a nutshell, how metabolism is working. And genetic information, I'm going to come back to this in a little more detail later on, but just what I want you to take now is that there are patterns in the genetic code, and these have been known about for 60 years, since, since the early 1960s, um, which suggests that there are direct interactions between the, the, the codons, which is to say the, 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 the units within DNA or RNA that codes for an amino acid in a protein, uh, and the amino acid itself. In other words, there's a kind of stickiness, you may say. There are interactions between that particular letter and that particular amino acid. And what that suggests is that the genetic code is not just some random arbitrary assortment, but that if you had a, a random string of RNA, a random string of letters, then you would have a non-random string of amino acids that in one way or another, and it may be more like this, I, we don't need to specify exactly how that works, the patterns are there anyway. Um, what it suggests is that there are direct interactions between the amino acids and the bases in the genetic code that code for them. And so a random RNA sequence codes a non-random peptide. If that peptide has function in whatever environment it may be, then natural selection as we know it can start. And there's no mystery about the origin of, uh, of, of, of information in biology. So one thing to say about that immediately. Um, what I'm suggesting here is that we have electricity driving metabolism, which is giving rise to genes, and that means it's all got to happen in one place, and that's already a little bit unnerving if you're thinking about the origin of life. Most theories on the origin of life until now have said, okay, well, this chemistry happens best over here, and that chemistry works over there, and this works down here, and we can bring them all together somehow, and then they will, as I say, congeal into cells and crawl out of the test tube. Well, they don't do that. Um, so what do they do? Well, in some kind of a place where we've got a continuous reactivity, continuous gases being brought together, let's say hydrogen and CO2, to react together to form these molecules, forming uh, genes in the same place. It's a scary hypothesis, but at least it's testable, and you could say it's very easily testable because you can do it, if you, if you can get the right conditions, you can do it on a lab bench. If it's all happening in the same place, then you can just go straight ahead and test it. So what kind of place could it possibly be? Well, the place I favor, it doesn't have to be here, but uh, this, this, is a, this is something that we can get our head around, um, are, are what are known as alkaline hydrothermal vents. They were discovered by Deb Kelly, who was captain of the Alvin submersible back in the year 2000. Uh, and before that, there have been other deep sea hydrothermal vents known back into the 1970s. But this, these are quite different. They're not smoking in the way that you'll mostly be familiar, I'm sure, with the idea of black smokers with a chimney and smoke coming out of the top, billowing out of the top. They're not like that. They almost look dead. They're not dead. These are living vent systems with, with fluids going through them. And, and Deb Kelly here has got a, a lump of a black smoker with this chimney uh, structure. And this is a bit of Lost City. And it, you may be able to see it looks a bit like a mineralized sponge. It's a, it's a kind of a, a labyrinth of interconnected pores. Um, and so there are, there are alkaline fluids, hydrothermal fluids, kind of winding their way uh, through these interconnected pores. Now, they're not produced by the same mechanism that makes the, the black smoke events. The black smokers are produced by effectively direct interaction between magma volcanic magma and, 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 and ocean water at the spreading centers uh, of the mid-ocean ridges and so on. What's happening here, where, where, where we're away from this, and, and water will effectively percolate down into the, into the 
sea floor. Um, and if the sea floor is relatively close to the mantle, and this, this tends to happen these days close to the close to the ridges, this is 15, 20 kilometers away from the mid-Atlantic ridge. These green minerals here, it's called olivine, it's actually the, the most common mineral uh, in the Earth's mantle. It's also extremely common in interstellar space. Um, it's called olivine just because it looks a bit like olives. It's really that simple. Um, and, and it's water it will percolate down as much as five, five or six kilometers underneath the sea floor and react with this olivine. And it's an exothermic reaction. It's releasing heat. Um, and it's releasing these alkaline fluids. So they're warm and they're buoyant and they bubble back up and plenty of hydrogen gas. Um, and it's basically just the oxidation of water that's going on. Sorry, the oxidation of iron. So ferrous iron is going to ferric iron and water is being converted into, into hydrogen. Um, they, these same kind of vents should form on any wet, rocky planet. And they happen on a global scale. So this is, um, if this is the mid-Atlantic mid ridge, would be somewhere, somewhere around here. We have these reactions going on in, in the crust. And then now, with tectonic spreading, it's spreading across the ocean floor and then being subducted down. In effect, what's happening is the water is reacting with the rock and hydrating the rock. And then this hydrated rock is being subducted. And at the increasing temperatures and pressures, water is being driven off again. And that water in the mantle is melting the mantle and causing convection currents in the mantle. And that is driving volcanic activity on the planet, on literally a planetary scale. So it's then it's quite interesting that Mars, for example, which is a fairly small planet, there's plenty of evidence that it had oceans uh, four billion years ago, maybe three and a half billion years ago on Mars. And, and they disappeared. And there's various explanations for where they went. But one interesting explanation is this same process of called serpentinization, um, whereby the rock, uh, the, the minerals like olivine react with water, get subducted down. But on a smaller planet, which is cooling faster, the temperatures are cooler now because the, the core is cooling down. Less of that water is driven off. And effectively, Mars buried its oceans uh, as, as uh, rock, as hydrated rock. And that's one of the reasons why, why Mars uh, effectively seems to have died as a planet. Maybe there's still life hanging on there. Who knows? We'll find out. But um, it would be, to me, quite surprising if there was. And it certainly, it's not had any real impact on the atmosphere. Occasionally, we see traces of methane. Methane could also be produced by, um, by this process of serpentinization. Incidentally, I, I didn't define serpentinization, it sounds a bit intimidating. I say minerals like olivine are reacting with water and effectively rusting. And they're being converted into another mineral called serpentinite. And that's the process of serpentinization. It's a metamorphosis. Uh, why is it called serpentinite? Because it looks like a serpent's scales. Again, the geologists have got these intimidating terms that just mean something very simple. Uh, this, we have a rock that looks like olives converted into a rock that looks like serpent scales. It's called serpentinization, and it happens throughout the universe. This is, um, this is Enceladus, which is one of the moons of Saturn. And there are these plumes that were, were initially seen by Cassini on its fly past of Saturn. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and these are alkaline. They're around about pH 9. They're rich in hydrogen and methane and plenty of organic molecules in there. So the interpretation of this is beneath the frozen surface of Enceladus, there is a liquid ocean. And beneath that liquid ocean, um, there, is a, there, there is a rocky, um, olivine-rich, um, I don't know what you'd call it, really. Not, not, not exactly a mantle. I'm not sure, sure. I'm not a geologist what the term would be. But anyway, uh, olivine-rich rock underneath the ocean. Serpentinizing, giving rise to this uh, alkaline ocean and, and, um, and, and the pressure is producing these plumes through cracks in the ice. This idea of uh, planetary scale things going on, it's, um, this is not a very exact analogy, but it's a very interesting analogy. That the structure of a cell, the topological structure of a cell and the topological structure of a planet are very similar to each other. So if this is the Earth, for example, 
The inside has a negative charge relative to the outside. All of the iron, which is buried down in the core, is effectively electron-rich, whereas the atmosphere, the oceans and so on, are relatively electron-poor. We have gases like carbon dioxide and so on. It's relatively oxidized outside. So um, it's also relatively more acidic outside. Um, this is slightly more um, problematic, but effectively, if you see these as, as um, hydrothermal vents, between the mantle and the ocean, then we have al alkaline fluids coming out going into a relatively acidic early ocean. Now, cell structure is basically it's the same. It's negatively charged inside. It's relatively reduced inside, plenty of electrons uh, and, and protons on the outside. So at a slightly hand-wavy level, there is an interesting topological equivalence between planets like the Earth, wet rocky planets, and the structure of cells. And this was first noticed, really, I don't know if it was first noticed, but it was noticed and pointed out uh, by uh, a guy called Mike Russell 30 years ago now. Um, and after, after the discovery of Lost City by Deb Kelly, um, his ideas became quite well known. He predicted the existence of vents like Lost City 10 years before their discovery. And his ideas throughout the 90s were pretty marginal in the field, nobody was very interested in them. And, and you can look back at conference proceedings and, and see the discussions after people's talks and there would be Mike Russell jumping up and saying, yeah, but what about alkaline hydrothermal vents? And everybody would ignore him. And it was quite interesting to see this dynamic all written up in volumes of uh, forgotten life sciences history. Then after the discovery of Lost City, he suddenly became much more famous. This was a, a feature article by Nature in the year 2009 uh, and they photoshopped him up as Erasmus, as the Renaissance man. And they called him Naissance man, Naissance as in the birth of life. Um, and this is his reactor. He was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Uh, and this is a little bit of Lost City uh, behind him. And essentially what he was arguing, uh, and what I still think to be the right way of seeing the question, is that there are high concentrations of hydrogen in these alkaline fluids bubbling up into the ocean. Uh, and, and the oceans, the early oceans, were CO2 rich. We, it's very hard to constrain how much, but probably as much as one bar of carbon dioxide in those early oceans. They would have been mildly acidic, perhaps pH 5 or 6. And that means this is the, this is the, um, the, the, the sponge-like, mineralized sponge-like structure, all of these interconnected micropores. Um, Four billion years ago, before there was any oxygen, this is now carbonate rocks, but we would expect to see lots of iron and nickel and transition metals in there as well, because these dissolved in the oceans before there was any oxygen around, especially in acidic oceans. So we would expect to see some of these walls effectively containing catalytic transition metals uh, and equivalents. Um, and, uh, and so reactive fluids percolating, wending their way through, ocean waters coming in. This is really um, an, an electrochemical flow reactor um, where we've got the two components that I was saying earlier on, make up the Krebs cycle, or the first starting point for life, hydrogen and CO2 being forcibly reacted together with natural proton gradients, which is to say differences in the proton concentration between the ocean waters and the alkaline fluids, probably across these barriers across potentially quite short distances. So we've got a system here which has a structure which is reminiscent of cells, and we've got all the right ingredients to be reacting together to make the components of cells. So at least you can imagine that this may be um, a, a, suitable, a suitable starting point for life. So this is, um, this is my, my hypothesis, which is grounded in the work of the people that I've been talking about but I'm not sure any of them would necessarily see it quite this way, and, and I wouldn't have dared to show anybody this slide even five or six years ago. It's very simple, um, and I'll explain it briefly, but it's, um, I, I wouldn't have dared to say it because it, it's, 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 there's big claims going on here, uh, and they're experimentally tractable qu questions, uh, and the reason I dare to show it you now is that a lot of them are beginning to show signs that there's truth in them. So imagine this is a pore in one of these hydrothermal vents. We've got acidic ocean waters percolating in. We've got iron sulfur minerals in these, in these barriers, not just that, so silicate and carbonate and things as well, but some iron sulfur minerals. Driving a reaction between hydrogen and CO2, not necessarily a complete Krebs cycle, but at least some of these intermediates in the Krebs cycle to make the most thermodynamically favored products. Lipids, 
which is to say fatty acids, fat and long chain, um, long chain hydrocarbons, uh, and amino acids. These are the two most thermodynamically favoured groups. If we did make lipids, we potentially would expect that they would form some kind of a, I'm going to call it a protocell. Uh, it's got a, a bilayer membrane around it, and it's snuggling in. I'm showing it deliberately snuggling into a pore here. I'm exaggerating. Uh, but this, effectively, this pore is templating a cell. And the cell is snuggling in with a bilayer membrane around it. And now it's a semi-closed system, and we can make more things, not just lipids and amino acids, but also sugars, maybe nucleotides. For this to be happening, we need that bit. <laughs> this iron-sulfur mineral... Well, if we want to be fixing these things inside a protocell, then this needs to be sticking in this membrane. Protons need to be crossing that membrane. We need to have all this happening inside in a continuous flow. So we're combining the structure of the vent with the continuous flow of things. And this, I, I hope, will be beginning to challenge you because certainly I would be thinking, well, really? <laughs> Can we really believe that that's true? And then just to, as a final challenge, if we can get as far as nucleotides, then we can begin to have RNA. We can begin to have a kind of an RNA world, but inside um, these growing protocells. And now we've got amino acids becoming peptides. We've got uh, RNA, uh, which is uh, the, 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 the kind of more reactive equivalent of DNA, if you're not so familiar with these things. Um, and the beginnings of, of making proteins, the beginnings of information and the beginnings of real protein function in cells. So it's a very simple hypothesis, and it, it really it, it challenges uh, our ability to believe our own hypotheses in science. But the, the, the good thing is it is eminently testable. So I'm going to run through, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data with some of this, and I kind of apologize for that because it's not supposed to be a seminar. But at the same time, if I just stand here and wave my arms around and say, yeah, take it from me, it's really going to happen, you should, really should not believe me. So I'm going to show you that we can do some experiments, that this is actually science, um, and, and I'll show you the kind of experiments that we can do. I'm going to skim over them quite lightly, and if you've got questions, feel free to either interrupt and ask as I'm going along uh, or, or ask at the end. Um, anyway, so this idea that life is powered by electric membranes, it goes back to uh, 1961, uh, to a paper from Peter Mitchell in, in 1961 uh, on what he called the chemiosmotic hypothesis. And this is, this is an older picture, and it's with Jennifer Moyle. And, and Jennifer Moyle, um, she was working with Mitchell from 1947. This is 1947 in Cambridge. Um, and, and she was a brilliant experimentalist, and most of the good papers that they wrote together in the 1960s on the chemiosmotic hypothesis, the best papers were Mitchell and Moyle together. Um, and she did all the experimental work. Mitchell was a brilliant theoretician. He was cack-handed in the lab. He could never finish an experiment. It was Moyle that really did the experimental work. Um, and, and Mitchell, of course, of course, perhaps you don't know, but Mitchell in 1978 was awarded the Nobel Prize for chemistry by himself. I'm increasingly thinking, and I've been kind of digging around in the literature, um, but I, I think uh, now, if that were to happen, then Moyle would have won the Nobel Prize with him. I think, luckily, times are changing, but I think that was a miscarriage of justice. Anyway, before this hypothesis was first published in 1961, uh, Mitchell was at a conference in Moscow, 1957, on the origin of life. It was organized by Oparin, who was a great Soviet... Um, well, I suppose he was a chemist, uh, interested in the origin of life. Uh, and a lot of the great scientists in the world at the time, so people like J.B.S. Haldane was there, um, and, um, and Mitchell himself was there as well, um, and, and J.D. Bernal was there. A lot of them were communists, which was why they went to, uh, to, to Moscow and why they were interested. But it's also interesting that because there's such a materialistic basis to, uh, to, to, to Marxism and communism, they were interested in, in questions like the origin of life in a way that many other people weren't at the time. So, you know, there's a reason why it was happening in Moscow. So Mitchell really was not a, not a, not a communist really at all. Um, in fact, he was from a very wealthy family and he used to drive a, a silver Rolls Royce around Cambridge in the, in the, during the war time. Uh, and, and, and this is a, a quite a poetic view uh, here. I love this quote um, because it, it's, it's eye-opening when you think about the origin of life. He says, I cannot consider 
the organism without its environment. From a formal point of view, the two may be regarded as equivalent phases between which dynamic contact is maintained by the membranes that separate and link them. So the inside of a cell and the outside world are equivalent phases. He's not separating life out and saying this is what life is and this is what the environment is. He's conflating them. He's saying they're equivalent to each other which is a strange thing to say, but if you're thinking about the origin of life, before there is such a thing as a cell that we would recognize, before there is really an organism or a living system, thinking about phases as your equivalent, separated and joined by a membrane, is a very productive way of thinking about the question. And this is, to my mind, what we have in a hydrothermal vent. We have a, a, a barrier, or we have alkaline hydrothermal fluids inside, and we have acidic ocean waters on the outside. And so the topology is equivalent to a bacterial cell. Here's a bacterial cell. We're pumping out protons, and so it's relatively acidic on the outside, and it's relatively alkaline on the inside, and potentially it's three pH units difference between the inside and the outside. So it's the same magnitude and it's the same topology uh, as, as, uh, as cells. So is there any way that we can kind of go from here to there. The other thing to notice about this, we're pumping out protons all the time in our own body, but why? Because we're putting them to work, to power, to power work. And so the influx of protons is driving work, and the influx of protons across here could potentially drive work as well. What kind of work could it potentially do? Before there are any enzymes, any genes, any, any, any kind of structures that you would think could do anything useful, uh, what on earth could it actually do? Well, there is a simple answer. Um, and it, it's basically, it's about driving growth. Why would that happen? The problem with hydrogen and CO2 is they're just not very reactive. The, the first couple of steps to get them to react is really difficult. And so if you were to just take a mixture of gases, hydrogen and CO2, and put them in a test tube and heat them up to, say, 50 degrees and shake them up for half a billion years, nothing much is really going to happen. Um, actually, thermodynamically, you should get cells. Incredibly, you should get cells. They are more thermodynamically favored than just a mixture of hydrogen and CO2. The problem is this first couple of steps to get to formaldehyde is uphill. We don't need to go into the details of, of um, redox chemistry. All you really need to notice is it's uphill and it's quite steeply uphill to get them to react. But that is at the same pH. What we actually have in a hydrothermal vent is the alkaline fluids at pH 11 and the acidic ocean waters, let's say pH 6. And now you can see it's downhill. Why is it downhill? It's, it's quite simple, again, intuitively to understand. If, imagine hydrogen gas. It wants to pass its electrons onto something else. That leaves behind the protons, and the protons, well, that's what makes an acid. So uh, you know, pro, pro, uh, an acid is rich in protons. If you make those protons in an alkaline environment, they'll immediately react with hydroxide to form water. It's a neutralization reaction. It's, extreme, it's extremely rapid. It's thermodynamically favored. It's going to happen instantaneously and release a lot of heat. So it's just a neutralization. If you try to release protons in an acidic environment, well, you're making an acid more acid. That's not really favored in terms of chemistry. So it's going to be much more reactive in an alkaline environment. And CO2, well, it picks up an electron. Now it's got a negative charge. If it's in an acidic environment, it can pick up a proton. Now it's balanced the charges. Now another electron. Now another proton. And off we go. We can make it. So it becomes easier. CO2 becomes more reactive in an acidic environment. And so its downhill is going to happen so long as we have hydrogen in one phase at pH 11 and CO2 in a different phase at pH 6 and they're not constantly mixing. They're not just forming the same, same thing. So that's what we have in these vents. And this is a fairly simple experiment. Actually, we've been building reactors and trying to make these things react for quite a long time, an embarrassingly long time. And it's got smaller and smaller and more and more controllable. And this is a microfluidic chip. Um, you can see it there as well, inside this anaerobic glove box. Um, and we have parallel flow, acidic flow with, uh, with, 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 ions, with iron chloride and alkaline flow with sodium sulfide. And it precipitates this very thin barrier. And what we're hoping is that protons or maybe electrons, we're still not sure which, unbelievably, will cross this barrier and, and, and reduce CO2 to make organic molecules. Does it work? Well, yes, it does. It's, it's, not, um, it's not hugely impressive, I have to admit. 
Um, it's taken us a long time even to get to this. This is the kind of thing, if you're not a scientist, um, then may, may, maybe, maybe this will help you understand. People get amazingly excited about that. Um, that is formate, um, which is to say it's the very first step of reacting hydrogen and CO2 to make the very first, very first product. So it's a step in the right direction. And it's sticking up quite a long way above this baseline. Sometimes this baseline is quite, is quite lumpy and bumpy, and, and, and so this is not a bad peak, really. Um, and so it's, it's proof that it can begin to happen. And over here, um, this one is, no, this one is acetate, which is two carbons joined together. And we've managed to get three carbons joined together. And you'll probably be thinking, well, wow, <laughs> well done. But um, it's, it's kind of... It's taken us 10 years. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing, as I say. Um, other people have gone much further, uh, and, but they've very often used higher pressures and all kinds of interesting minerals. This is with very freshly precipitated with just a pH gradient. And if you, cut, if you cut out the pH gradient, it doesn't work. You don't get anything. If you cut out some of the transition metals, like nickel, it doesn't work. You don't get anything. So it's, even though it looks incredibly cheap, um, it, it, it is actually quite exciting. It's a proof of concept that a pH gradient across a barrier will drive CO2 fixation uh, and make the organic molecules. And, and notice acetate, it's actually one of the Krebs cycle. In the reverse Krebs cycle, it's one of the intermediates, one of the universally conserved intermediates. Now, I said other people have done more than we have. We're, we're now talking higher temperatures and higher pressures and things like that. But um, some, some people have produced longer chain fatty acids doing, doing that. Um, and, and they'd done that 20 years ago, actually, not using pH gradients. And, and we'd taken a selection of, of these and tried to see, well, if you remember my, my picture, I was, drawing, I was showing you a, a, a protocell nestling snugly inside a, a, a pore. Well, that requires a bilayer membrane, and that requires something really simple. And so the question was, if we take these fatty acids that have been made, and, and something called fatty alcohols, which are also kind of a long chain of carbons joined together with an alcohol group stuck on the end, do we get things that look like protocells? And the answer is yes. The, this is cryo-electron microscopy, and it's got a bilayer membrane around an aqueous space inside. These are similar things. This is, this is confocal microscopy. Um, and I think this one is at, at, at pH 7, but this one's at pH 12, and these are also at pH 12. So we are able to make them, and they make stable protocells, um, quite beautiful to look at. When you see them live, as it were, they're moving around and doing interesting things. They're quite dynamic. Um, so, yes, and, and, and the question there was, well, are they stable in these harsh conditions in a hydrothermal vent at 70 degrees centigrade? And, pH 9 or 10 or 11, and, and, and lots of salt and calcium and magnesium and all the rest of it? And the answer is yes, that has all of those things in. So it is quite easy to make them, it turns out. And this, uh, I'm not going to go through the details here, uh, but another, uh, this is another thing where scientists get ridiculously excited about, let's say, that, this little shoulder here. This is what's called UV-Vis spectroscopy. Uh, and that shoulder is diagnostic of what are called 4-Fe-4-S clusters, which is a kind of little cube um, of iron and sulfur. And they're found in some of the most important proteins in biology, things like ferrodoxin, which are directly doing CO2 fixation in pretty much all cells. You've, these are ancient proteins, and they always contain these little cubes of iron and sulfur. And they're like minerals. Um, and actually, they're formed as if in the same way as minerals. They form spontaneously. And, and, and so this is the kind of the machinery, this is the most simple machinery you could imagine for CO2 fixation, which is becoming biology. And they have a diagnostic shoulder on UV-Vis spectroscopy. So as soon as you see this, you think, whoa, we, we expected that we would, we would mix iron, iron chloride and sodium sulfide and cysteine, the amino acid cysteine, a pH 9, and we mix it up and... And I, what I thought we would see would be smaller crystals, big things, but, but getting smaller, coated in cysteine. That's kind of what I expected to see. I didn't expect to see that. Suddenly we've gone from, when you do it without the cysteine, everything goes black. It's, you, you, just form a, you just form the mineral, you just form iron sulfide minerals, and everything goes black. And when we first started doing these experiments quite a while ago now, uh, the first PhD student I had 
Um, she became terribly depressed in the first month or two because every experiment just went black every time. <laughs> There's nothing. That she could, it took a long time to figure out we need alkaline pH and we need all the. You know, but, um, so, so surprisingly, again, surprisingly long time. And, and eventually, we get through to forming these. It depends on the amount of cysteine that you have. It depends on the concentration of iron. And I won't go through the details of these. Here's what these little clusters look like. That is this that I showed you. This is from my original slide that I showed you. So what I'm saying is it's quite easy to make the bilayer membrane surrounding it, and it's quite easy to make these little clusters of iron and sulfide that are doing CO2 fixation in modern cells. They have exactly the same chemistry. Um, and they will fix CO2. This is formate and this is acetate. And I, again, I won't go through the details, but the green one here is just pure water. This is done on an electrode. Uh, so there is an electrical potential here as well, but when we have the clusters, we get an awful lot more uh, than you get in the absence of the clusters. So again, it does work. We can effectively build this machinery that life uses with the most simple imaginable ingredients. Okay, so that's effectively turning gases into the core molecules of life. What happens next? Well, metabolism. This is, uh, this is a tube map of metabolism, the kind of the London underground. The remarkable thing about it is that this basic topology is, again, it's conserved across all of life. You don't need to worry about the details, but that, that kind of that map, it's like, imagine that you, you, you go to Paris and you look at the, the, the underground map in Paris and you find it's exactly the same as the underground map in London. And you go, to, you go to New York, and it's exactly, it's not the same conceptually, it's got the same stations, it's incredible, everything is exactly the same. What's happening down these, it's not as if you've just got some kind of flow going down, what, what's really happening is each of these molecules is converting into another molecule. Um, so this is the kind of the line going from pyruvate through to valine, for example, or to alanine. Um, these are molecules being converted into other, into other things. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's not very equivalent to a, a tube map in that sense, but it's remarkable that the genes that code for this map, they're not the same. They're, I mean, some of them are the same, but most of them are different in, for example, bacteria and archaea, two of the domains of life. And what that suggests is that this tube map is actually older than the genes. Now, again, that's something of an assertion but what it suggests then is that a lot of it should happen spontaneously, that we should be able to just do this chemistry in the lab without there being any enzymes there, any genetic programming there, nothing which should just happen spontaneously in the right environment. And this is just one example showing more or less that. We're starting with, let me just go back a moment, oxaloacetate, which is here, so we're just feeding it this. Um, and we're looking to see if we get aspartate. This is a very difficult reaction and has never been done before. Um, and what we're also seeing, we're seeing alanine and pyruvate and glycine and serine. So these, this is alanine. These are different metal ions that we're using, so I, I won't spend much time on the details. We're getting a, a not, not large amounts, but hundreds of micromolar with, ferric, with copper and with ferric iron, but nothing with those. Aspartate is quite hard, but some metal ions do the job. But we're also getting glycine and serine and alanine. Um, and these, this was on GCMS, this is just what we measured. Which means that we've got this flow going through this system. And it's not coming up with other things. We, we are, it's like the train is following the lines even in the absence of any, any genes. So it's not much, but it's there. And we've also got through as far as cysteine, for example, so all the way through to here, uh, which is what's binding those iron sulfur clusters. So this is early days. There's another group in Strasbourg who's done more of this kind of work than we have. Um, they've managed to do pretty much all of the Krebs cycle, pretty much most of this pathway coming down here. And now uh, a lot of sugar. We've also done sugar synthesis coming through to ribose and so on. A lot of this map has been done in the lab in the last 10 years, since 2015, eight years. Um, and it works. Not everyone's done it under the same conditions. It's not as if we start here and just go whoosh right the way through this whole system. One group does this little bit, another group does that bit, someone else does this bit. Um, but it's interesting that piecing it together, it seems to be spontaneous chemistry. It's a lot harder to try and get flow going through the entire system. That could take years. 
possibly decades, who knows? But at least it begins to give you a little faith, uh, I would say, that this kind of chemistry is really possible. Think about the early Earth four billion years ago. We've got an entire planet covered in hydrothermal vents, covered in these hydrothermal systems. There was no distinction between the crust and the mantle at that time. So these vent systems were everywhere. And how many million years do you want? So the idea that in, 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 the, in the scope of a PhD thesis on a bench top in a, in, a, in, a, in a small lab, which is always struggling to get funded, that we can make all of this stuff happen, of course it's not going to happen. If we can get anything to happen at all, it's a step in the direction. So I think, again, to return to my point at the beginning, intellectually we're beginning to get a feel for how this kind of chemistry might work out. And we, we're beginning to do the experiments that suggest that it's not completely impossible. It's not, it's not utterly improbable. Uh, this was showing um, that we can make uracil, which is one of the letters in, in, in RNA and DNA. This is not too many steps, but we start with ammonia and carbonate and aspartate, and we can go right the way through there. This is uracil and orotate as a one-pot synthesis. And when we, when we optimized the conditions, we got about 10 times as much uracil just in these last three steps here. And interestingly, those conditions turned out to be uh, 90 degrees centigrade, pH 8.5, one molar sodium chloride, um, so quite similar to alkaline hydrothermal vents. So again, this is just showing that whole pathways can spontaneously happen. And this is an interesting one. This is ATP that I mentioned at the beginning. These days, it's made by this astonishing rotating motor, the ATP synthase, um, which is, it's a this is the membrane here. It's got this literally rotating motor, and it's making ATP. It's one of the most magical um, molecular machines. It's just beautiful. And it's rotating. This is, this is not really rotating slowly like that. It's going 200 times revolutions a second, up to 500 revolutions a second. It's extraordinarily fast. Um, and and it's, convert, it's just phosphorylating ADP to ATP. So it's adding a phosphate group on to ADP. And it's been a big question, well, how, you know, how do we make ATP then in the absence of a sophisticated protein like that? There are ways of doing it. But here's, this is just showing, again, with ferric iron and water uh, and, and a two-carbon acetyl phosphate, we get about 15 to 20% yield of ATP. It, it varies depending on the temperature. Um, most metal ions didn't work, only ferric iron worked. Uh, and, and we could do it with ATP, but not with the other bases. So this, why is it the universal energy currency? In part because you can make it in water with ferric iron as a catalyst and acetyl phosphate as a phosphate donor. Um, so it's prebiotic chemistry. It works, and you, you get specifically ATP. We're not synthesizing ATP all the steps. This is just the last bit of phosphorylating, but it's interesting that it, it works. Okay, information. And keep an eye on the time. Mm, I'm going a little slow. Are you all right? <laughs> Should we have a music break? <laughs> um, I'll keep going for now. So information. Um, this is kind of what you've seen already. This is the pattern of metabolism. I'm talking about pyruvate. These are the Krebs cycle intermediates up here. And it's color-coded. These are all amino acids. And in gray, they all have a G at the first position of the codon. So, so um, in, in, in DNA and RNA, the, the, each amino acid is encoded by three letters. It's called a codon. Uh, and those three letters, um, in, in the first one for glycine, is always a G, and so on. This, this is when the first letter is, uh, is an A for adenosine. In blue, it's uh, encoded by cytidine. And in, in green, it's by uh, a, a U. And you can see immediately looking at that that there's some interesting structure there. That it's, it looks as if the, the G is very close to CO2 fixation and, and, and the, the blue ones are much further away. And that is indeed the case. We see a kind of correlation. It's a reasonable correlation, not perfect, but um, this is the number of steps from CO2 to the amino acid and it's the shorter distance from G to U. The outlier down here is cysteine, which is that one, which um, we, have, we have reasons why we can, ex we can explain why that's an outlier, we think. Um, that's the first position of the codon. If we organize this by the first position of the codon, so a G or an A at that first position, or a C or a U, this is the second position of the anticodon, uh, and this is, um, this is the hydrophobicity 
And so, so the V is, uh, is valine, it's a very hydrophobic amino acid, and it's encoded, the colours changed here, unfortunately, this is now an A, so valine is encoded at the second position of the anticodon by an A, which is the most hydrophobic base. So we have effectively the most hydrophobic base encodes the most hydrophobic amino acid. And here we have a spartate, and it's encoded by a U, which is the most hydrophilic amino acid encoded by the most hydrophilic base. So we see this relationship between how much water-loving or water-hating they are. It suggests they're snuggling up to each other in some way. Um, it's less strong if we're, if we're further away. If we're looking at C and U, so these were the ones that were further away uh, at the first position, there is a relationship, but it's not very impressive. But these first two, it really does look as if there are direct interactions between amino acids and the bases that code for them. And this is the third position, um, and this is a, what's called an inverted codon table. So first of all, most people would think that the third position is usually just thought of as redundant. There's not much information in that third position. So w where it's white, it is redundant. There can be more than one amino acid encoded there. But where it's, um, where it's colored, these are not redundant. It's a single amino acid is encoded by, by that. So you can see immediately that it's not a random patterning. The redundancy itself is not random in the genetic code. And if I just consider one example, so this is glutamate, and it's the same color as aspartate over here. They've both got a G at the first position of the codon. They've both got an A at the second position of the codon. But this glutamate has a purine, and aspartate has a pyrimidine. Now, purines have got two rings, they're bigger. Pyrimidines have got a single ring, they're smaller. And it corresponds to the size of the amino acid. So we can predict most of the code on the basis of these interactions. It's kind of circular. We're predicting the code from patterns that are inside the code anyway, so it's, you know, there's some problem here. Um, but we can also test these things. Um, we can, we've done molecular dynamic simulations and an NMR. And this, I'll just give one example here. So this is the amino acid proline, and we're looking to see how much time does it spend close to each of these bases, A, C, G, or U. And within about two angstroms, so really snuggling up, it's spending a lot of time with the G, and it's not spending so much time with the other bases. G is the one that encodes it at the second position of the anticodon. For arginine, we also get it correct, but there's a lot of overlap here. So it's kind of weak and statistical, but we, we can predict about 50% of the code on these interactions. Um, and it's interesting, this is our, our, our best, this is the one, so, so here, for example, uh, with, with proline, um, we think that it should be with a G, um, and that's here. So we, we think G first, and then, um, so this is the second guess, this is the third one, and this is the, the worst one. And I've put a ring around the correct base. And, and they're organized according to hydrophobicity. So these things are very hydrophobic, these things are very hydrophilic, and we get 50% correct, but they're all the hydrophilic end. At the hydrophobic end, we don't do very well. So this molecular dynamic simulations, I'm not really a proper chemist. Um, it's all about the forces between atoms, and how strong, are the, how strong are hydrophobic interactions or how strong is charge interactions, over what distance does it operate and so on. And they're a little bit clunky uh, and they don't seem to be very good at these hydrophobic ones. We did that with two different programs and we got the same results more or less. And we, and we got the same thing with NMR as well. NMR also has a problem with hydrophobicity because you can't dissolve hydrophobic amino acids in water at a high concentration or the bases and so you don't have a good signal. So it's very messy. It's funny, this is chemistry that people have been doing over decades and it's still messy. But there is a pattern and it seems to be supported by the data and that can explain the origins of information in biology. This is a summary slide of everything I've said really. We've got a proton gradient across a membrane driving the reaction between hydrogen and CO2 going into a proto-metabolism making amino acids and nucleotides. We're polymerizing the nucleotides to make RNA polymerizing the, the amino acids to make peptides. We have stereochemical interactions between them. We've got something like translation going on here, making, making these things. And we have all kinds of positive feedback loops interacting there, which can make this system 
increase. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but we can imagine very simple ways in which these amino acids can interact with very small aptomers uh, of RNA. Right. For the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to touch on consciousness. Um, in bacteria, not in us. And when I say consciousness, let me confess, probably what I'm going to talk about is not what you would understand by consciousness. Um, but the question for me as a biochemist for a long time, and I've never understood it, is, is, is what are feelings in biochemical terms? What we seem to care most about, I think, as, as humans, and what we're scared about with AI and so on is, is uh, w will it become scarily human? Will it, will it become conscious? Will it start being sentient, have feelings, all of these kind of things? And, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people in the AI world are very interested now in, well, what, what, what does biology have to say about consciousness? And the answer is, well, not very much. Um, it's been known as the hard problem for quite a long time, and the hard problem, more or less, is why is it that you know, what, a feeling of pain or of hunger or thirst or whatever it may be, what actually is that in terms of biochemistry? If a neuron depolarizes, why does it give rise to a feeling of anything at all? Um, now, in my view, it, it evolved. But if it evolved, then, it, um, then, then natural selection acted on something. And the question is, well, how far back does that go? It's, you can anesthetize all kinds of things. You can anesthetize an amoeba. You can anesthetize bacteria. So whatever it is that anesthetics are doing to consciousness is not only at the level of a central nervous system, it's also at the level of single cell critters. So what's happening? Uh, what I've been saying about how bacteria, how, how life started, this structure of cells and, and, and the three parts I've been talking about, the, and especially the electric membranes, um, what I'm going to put to you is that the, the electromagnetic fields, electrostatic electromagnetic fields on these membranes give a real-time integrated feedback to a bacterial cell about how they're doing in the world. And I'll explain that to you and then and why that may lead to the basis for amplifying everything um, as, as consciousness. So a real-time integrated feedback on, on your state in the world, I would say that's how it feels to be right now. And for a bacterial cell, that means, am I good or am I bad? Really, not much more than that. It's a kind of little bit of a, um, a binary system. So imagine, here's a bacterial cell. We've got the outside world and stuff happens in the outside world. And it needs to detect whatever's going on out there and, and do something. Um, it's it's a, a living cell. It's inside, all this got is the metabolism, all this stuff I've been talking about, all of these billions of reactions every second that's going on inside. There's nothing else in there. It's just chemistry. It's got genes in there, but genes are slow as well. So it, it's, uh, it's interesting. We've got literally one billion reactions a second going on inside here, and somehow they're going to determine what that cell decides it's going to do. So, what I've been telling you about is this Krebs cycle, and I'm keeping with the oxidative one here. We're stripping out hydrogen CO2. We've got food coming in, and we're pumping protons across that membrane to generate an electrical charge on the membrane. So this is what I've been setting up all along. But we don't have just one Krebs cycle in there. We actually have scores of them, probably thousands of them, all spinning at the same time potentially at different rates. Um, there's all kinds of things that could be going on. So what is synchronizing that cell at the same rate? To a large extent, it's the charge on the membrane because all of them are plugged into the membrane and for them to spin, they've got to push against the same force. And also, that force is powering ATP synthesis and for a lot of chemistry to happen in the cell, you need ATP and it needs to be far from equilibrium, which is to say you need that ratio of ATP to ADP to be a similar distance away. So this charge on the membrane is going to be forcing all of the biochemistry of the cell into effectively the same state, the same rate of operating. Uh, and you can gauge what that is from the strength of the charge on the membrane. And also, because this is moving charge, it will be generating electromagnetic fields as well. I suspect, but cannot prove to you, that there's a balance between electromagnetic and electrostatic fields that they can pick up on, which gives them an idea of how they're doing in relation to the environment. So, it needs to make a kind of a binary decision. Let's imagine it's too hot. Um, or maybe there's toxins there. What are you going to do? You, are you going to stay? 
or are you going to go? Are you going to paddle with your flagellum and move across? It's, it's a two-bit decision, really. You, you either you stay or you, you go, um, one bit. So um, you need to integrate all this information on your state in the world. Now, it could be that you, 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 you know, it's too hot. What am I going to do? My proteins are beginning to unravel. They're beginning to come undone. I'm going to set off some genes. I'm going to activate some genes and a stress response, which is going to fix my proteins. But it's going to take half an hour before these things are ready. And the, the, the proteins, I need to refold them. That's going to take minutes. Um, I can activate very, but how do I know what I just did? <laughs> I, I, I need to have some idea now about what my predicament is in the outside world. I need to know it's too hot. There has to be some information that this system is giving me about my predicament. I don't know yet because I just set off a gene response which is doing something, but I don't know which genes I triggered and I don't know what the problem is. So this is where a feeling is beginning to come in. It's effectively, I think it's too hot, I should move over there in terms of the fields on the membrane which are telling you the state that you're in. It's integrating all this information on the membrane. So that's what I'm proposing. Um, it's not completely hand-waving. I mean, this, I admit, immediately is the more hand-wavy bit of the talk. I think the origin of life stuff is, is becoming uh, science. This is uh, still philosophy, perhaps, more than science, but it's an interesting starting point. But there is also some data. So, for example, these are phages, bacteriophages, attacking a bacterium. And it's quite interesting what happens, because lots of bacteria will kill themselves, especially if they're part of a, a, a larger colony, a biofilm, for example, or, 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 or some kind of ocean bloom of bacteria. Um, why would they do that? Why would a single cell kill itself? Well, the answer, it's standard biology. It's what's called kin selection. And effectively, if you kill yourself, you also prevent the viruses from making copies of themselves. Then they can't infect the next cell, and so your genes and so on will do better in, in your relatives. You don't even have to be very closely related to the next cell. Still, you'll be somewhat related, and your genes will do better if you kill yourself. So how do you, if you're in this predicament of being taken down by viruses, how do you kill yourself? The answer is you unplug the membrane. You collapse the membrane potential. That's what you do. That will kill you in seconds. So this is really bacterial death. Is It's all about the membrane potential, um, which makes me think, you know, when they paddle, I showed you them paddling around, this is proton-powered. Again, it's the, the, all the behavior that, that bacteria do, all the import and export of things across that membrane is all powered by that membrane potential. So this is very much the life and death of what bacterial cells are actually doing. Now, this, I think, is the final slide. Um, we, are, we are made of more complex cells. We're made of eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotes have lots of mitochondria. These are the same things I've been showing you. These are all individual bacteria that became included in a much larger cell, or it became a larger cell in the end. Um, and they're all, they're all doing the same kind of thing, but now they've got to speak to each other. There's different ways they can do that. They can fuse together and fish, and there's all kinds of things they do, but somehow they're all together responsible for metabolism. And in a strange way, because when we breathe oxygen, it's going straight here. And when we're, when we're digesting food and burning food, it's going straight here. So although this is the interface with the world, Really what's happening is going on here. Any problems that we have in relation to the world, we feel them foremost in our mitochondria. And, they, and we need to integrate this information across maybe hundreds or thousands of mitochondria. And again, I'm thinking that fields are one way in which this can happen. And then this is, this is a single cell like an amoeba cell. Then we have multicellular organisms, and now we've got cells to bring together, all with these moving parts inside. And finally, a central nervous system which amplifies all of this. So the communications, the electrical communications between single cells and their interface with the world becoming incorporated into larger cells, incorporated into multicellular organisms, and finally into a central nervous system. This, I'm suggesting, is the substrate which gives rise in the end to the complexity of our own consciousness. Um, this is what I've said. Perhaps I don't need to say it again. I feel like I'm running out of time. So what I'm going to say instead is Thank you to the guys in my lab who've been working on this. It's pretty brave for them to do it at all. This is, in fact, an old slide. They're holding the Krebs cycle, and I like that so much. It was a birthday present a few years ago uh, that I've kept it. So half these guys have now left my lab, and I've had to put the ones who've joined uh, since then around the outside. I suppose I'll have to change this at some point. But um, 
it's a brave thing to do, to, to do a PhD on the origin of life, and uh, I'm beginning to start thinking about doing experiments on consciousness, which is probably even more foolhardy for them to join me. Uh, so, so I want to thank them especially. Thanks to the funders, and thank you very much for the invitation and for listening, and I'm very happy to take questions. Art of Molecule Podcast Engineering Life and Us